Uh, hey, as, uh, as Pastor Brock mentioned, and you know, between him and I, there's a little debate as to how to pronounce these correctly, but that's fine. Uh, so if you're wondering what these things are to my right and left, um, those, we're going to say it together, it looks like they're pronounced as chuppa, we'll put it up on the screen here, um, but we're going to pronounce it as, as hoopa. So on the count of three, I want everyone in unison, we're going to say hoopa, all right? One, two, three. Hoopa. That just, it's more exciting, my pronunciation, than Brock's, but he claims his is more authentic, so that's okay. We'll, we'll go with that. Um, anyways, hey, we got a lot, a lot of ground to cover this morning. Um, if you were with us last week, I kind of did the same thing, like, we just hit the ground running, so no stories, no side jokes, don't, don't get me off topic this morning. Uh, we are cruising right in, and this morning is the last Sunday for this series, and so we're going to be kind of summarizing it, and we are, we are getting to the mountaintop, so to speak, and so we will come back to these at the very end. I will address those, but for now, we are doing um, a non-direct flight this morning, and so the first stop you need to go to is Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. Um, if you need a Bible, we have the free orange ones always underneath your seats. Um, it, it's literally page 2. So we're, we're going back to the beginning here. So Genesis 2, and I'm going to start us at verse 18. Verse 18. Um, and here's the context if you don't know this story. Um, God, uh, Yahweh, the God of Israel, he's just created the world, like no big deal, just kind of casually did it. Um, So plants, animals, the whole everything. And then he gets to human beings and he gets to Adam. Um, And Adam's name is actually, it's not like his name like Mark. Adam actually just kind of means human. Um, It actually means dirt creature um, in the Hebrew. And so I kind of joke with people, all humans, we're actually, we're just, we're dirty people. That's literally what the Hebrew gets at there. So um, that's what God has done, and, and he's, he's made Adam as kind of the, the pinnacle of his creation. And so Adam and human beings, we are distinct in a couple of ways, one of which, and primarily, is that we are made in the image of God. And then secondly, and because of that, human beings are to steward all of this creation project that Yahweh has set in motion. And then we get to verse 18, um, and honestly, it's kind of a startling claim. And here's what we read. The Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone, and I'll make a helper suitable for him. Go down to verse 20. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. And so the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs, and then he closed up the place with flesh. And then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought it. He brought her to the man. And the man said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She should be called woman, for she was taken out of man. Um, and then we get to verse 24, and if you've been with us the last two months, we've, we've referenced verse 24 quite a bit. Um, this is the Bible's main statement and meaning of marriage right here in verse 24. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh, echad. And so right away we see in marriage that between one male and one female, they become one physically, sexually, and this is supposed to mirror our spiritual relationship with God, becoming one with Him. But then check this out, verse 25, Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. And so here, after just a couple verses in chapter 2, 
Um, This is the picture that emerges thus far in the biblical story, and this is so important. If you grew up in the church, you know these verses, um, and so I think we kind of become numb to them. But the first human beings, Adam and Eve, they're in a garden paradise, and God has created them to be sexual with one another. I mean, literally, they were made for each other. Like, one is taken out of the other, right? Adam says, now this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. And the key thing is to hear is, no, there's no sin here. And so a line that we've said a couple times from a guy named Mike Erie is that um, Adam and Eve, they were sexual before they were sinful. And I cannot emphasize that enough. They were sexual before they were sinful. And I think that's what verse 25 gets at when it says they were naked, they were sexual, and they were unashamed. And so they were sexual in a romantic relationship, and there was no dysfunction, there was no disappointment, there's no hurt, there's no pain, there's no shame, none of their uh, needs are are not met, Their their needs are met, and they were sexual before they were sinful. They were naked and unashamed. And I think part of the human story, regardless of our age, our gender, is that we long to go back to that garden reality, that divine paradise, right? We long to be in the presence of God and in an intimate, shame-free relationship with another human being who knows us at like our deepest levels but still loves us. And our problem is that when we are naked, we are ashamed. And for a number of different reasons, could be past hurts, could be fears and insecurities, um, could be a warped and distorted view of sexuality. And so the question automatically becomes like, okay, so what happened? Like, why why don't we experience things like Genesis 2? Like, what's gone wrong? How do we make sense of this? How have we gotten to where we are? And the scriptures give an answer to that. And so you turn to the next chapter, chapter 3. We'll start at verse 6. And this begins to be the biblical story as to why relationships today are messy and hard and painful. Starting at verse 6. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom... She took some and ate it. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. And here's where everything turns and goes south. Verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. And notice what they do. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. See, now they're naked and ashamed. Hence, they're scrambling to cover up their body. And then the man and his wife, they heard the sound of the Lord as he was walking in the garden. And I'm going to make a big deal out of of the garden this morning. Notice every time we, we read that word. Walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? And he answered, well, I heard you in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked, and so I hid. He's full of shame. And he said, well, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And now notice this. Notice the excuses, the blaming, the discord that begins to happen between the male and the female. This never happens, at least this never happens in my marriage. The man said, the woman you put me here with, she gave me the fruit from the tree and I ate it. Basically, he's like, it's her fault. And the Lord God said to the woman, well, what is this that you've done? And then notice what what the woman does. Well, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So then she 
passes the blame onto the serpent, which in this story represents Satan. Skip down a couple verses, verse 16. Um, we now begin to see the, the consequences uh, or, or the implication of these rebellious decisions that these first human representatives made. This is why we experience strife and tension between male and female today. This is why relationships are not easy, though they were created to be. Verse 16, God says this, to the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. I'm so sorry, ladies. Although I have heard that perhaps the male equivalent of giving birth is passing a kidney stone. Can any guys vouch for that here? Oh, see? There we go. I pray every morning that I never have to pass a kidney stone. <laughs> I've heard horrific things. Anyways, this is where the fracturing between male and female comes from. God says this. Listen to this. If you're an underliner, underline the second word. Your desire. We're going to come back to that word desire. Will be for your husband. And he will rule over you. This relationship, where literally she came out of him, they were kind of like attached, so to speak, is now no longer equal. It's no longer egalitarian. And now there's going to be discord, strife, disagreement, inferiority, attempts to dominate and one-up the other. This is the unraveling, the consequence of sin in relationships and so now it's the male's turn. God says to him, verse 17, to Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat from it all the days of your life. Skip down lastly to verse 21. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And so now they're no longer naked, but they are ashamed. Verse 23, so the Lord God banished them from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. All right, here's why we needed to take our first stop in Genesis 2 and 3. Here's what's going on so far. Adam and Eve the human representatives, they're in a garden, and they're naked, and they're unashamed. They're sexual before they were sinful. Sin comes in and disrupts this garden. And not only are they kicked out of the garden, but now there's animosity between them, between male and female. There's a desire to rule over one another. And so now the whole thing's been flipped. They're not naked, but they sure are ashamed. Remember, all of this takes place in a garden. Now, are you guys ready for this? This is cool. Like, this is why I love doing what I get to do. For the last time in this series, turn to Song of Songs. Song of Songs. So still in the Old Testament between Ecclesiastes and Isaiah. And let's go to chapter 4. Song of Songs, chapter 4. We're going to start at verse 12. If this is your first Sunday, um, you're coming at the very end of something. Um, but one of the points that we've made in this series is that Song of Songs is... Its genre literally is Jewish erotic poetry. So it is explicitly sexual. But then we also looked at last Sunday that it is sexual, but there's even something beyond that, though. There are spiritual implications. Chapter 4, verse 12. Um, as I read this, here's what I want you to do. I want you to pay attention to any garden 
imagery here. Because what I want to submit to you this morning is this. Is it accidental that there is garden imagery in Song of Songs? Is this perhaps a literary allusion to Adam and Eve in the garden? Let's find out. The male lover says this, verse 12, you are a garden locked up, my sister, my bride. You are a spring enclosed, a sealed fountain. Your plants are an orchard of pomegranates with choice fruits, with henna and nard. Isn't nard just like a cool word to say? Nard. I don't even know what nard is. Nard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon, with every kind of incense tree, with myrrh and alloys and all the finest spices. You are a garden, fountain, a well of flowing water streaming down from Lebanon. And then she says this, awake north wind and come south wind blow on my garden that its fragrance may spread everywhere. Let my beloved come into his garden and taste its choice fruits. I think the garden imagery is pretty explicit there. Let me take you to one more passage like this. Um, Chapter 6, verses 2 to 3. Again, notice the garden imagery. My beloved has gone down to his garden, to the beds of spices, to browse in the gardens, and to gather lilies. And then she says, I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. He browses among the lilies. I am my beloved, and my beloved is mine. See, throughout these love poems, you have this female and male lover, and you can pretty much turn to any chapter, and you're going to see this. They're in a garden with lush fruit, plants, lilies, and three times, and every commentator points this out, three times she says, I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. I mean, what this is, is it's a statement of mutual affection, of mutual belonging. And and the thing is, it's not in like a domineering, abusive way, but it's in like a voluntary relationship of concern, of love. It's almost like elsewhere in the Old Testament where, where Yahweh, the God of Israel, says, and I will be their God, and they'll be my people. And all of a sudden, I think we begin to see something that this whole collection of love poems is actually doing this. It's taking us back to the Garden of Eden where the male and female were naked and unashamed. Where there was no strife, no discord between them. They're equal and they're equally in love with each other. I am my beloved's, and my beloved's is mine. What I want you to see this morning is that I think in the story of God, Song of Songs takes on such a bigger role than just itself. I think it's actually whispering to us gently, do you want to go back to the garden? to the way things used to be. I think it's a story, it's poems that say, here's what it looks like for sexuality to be redeemed. To be what it originally was meant to be in the Garden of Eden. I don't think it's by chance that these love poems are saturated with garden imagery. Let me say this. Any Jewish reader at that time 
I mean, these poems are thousands of years old. Both back then and even to this day, it would be impossible for them to read these love poems and to hear and to see this garden imagery and for their minds to not go back to Genesis 2. It's just, it's their imagination. It'd be like, I, I, I thought of this this past week. I, I know some of us in this room, like, we've, we're from Chino. Now, I'm not, but I know some of you, like, you grew up in Chino, and you've been here since, like, the 50s, maybe earlier. And it looked nothing like the way it looks now. It'd be like this. If someone said, if they started sharing a story with you, and it involved, like, cows and flies... If you grew up in old Chino, when there was nothing but dairies, and then today, decades later, someone starts sharing a story with you, oh yeah, cows on a dairy and flies, I can guarantee you that instantly your mind would go back to when you lived on a dairy. I mean, just the mention of cows or flies or whatever it is will instantly bring your mind back to those times and that narrative of your life. The exact same thing would go on here for a Jewish reader to read love poems that have a garden landscape. Immediately, they'd be taken back to Genesis 2. Now, if you think that's not true and you're not buying that, that's okay. It's cool. We can agree to disagree. Let me show you one more thing. Chapter 7, Song of Songs. And this is where, oh, this is where I love to be a nerd. So chapter 7, verse 10. Listen to this statement, she says. I belong to my beloved and his desire is for me. Now, hang with me here. The word desire in Hebrew there is teshika. And teshika is an extremely rare Hebrew word. So rare that teshika is only used three times in the Old Testament. And this is one of its uses. So it's only used two other places in the scriptures. Guess where those two other places are? Genesis. Try Genesis 3 and Genesis 4. We read one of the verses in Genesis 3. Genesis 3.16 says this, Your desire, your, your teshika, will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. There, in Genesis 3.16, the, the teshika is, is in a negative, like, domineering sense, right? And, 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 and that's the, the crippling effects of sin. But now, and this is so rad, now in Song of Songs 7.10, the female lover tells her husband, I belong to my beloved, and his desire, his teshika, is for me. Do you see what's happened? They're in another garden, and the curse of sin is being reversed. The negative use of teshika is being flipped, and now it's being used in a positive sense. Their sexuality is being redeemed. They're equal alongside one another. They're experiencing intimacy as Yahweh made humans to experience. See, redemption is possible, brothers and sisters, even in your sexuality. Song of Songs, the story of God, what I want to tell you this morning, and I hope this just gets you excited, it offers us a picture of Eden restored in our sexuality. I think that Ultimately, big picture is the meaning of Song of Songs. Now, to be clear, and this is important, this doesn't mean, and I've said this, 
that their relationship is all rosy and hallmark perfect and, you know, whatever else. No, no, no. They, they still got issues in, in their marriage, right? So we talked about foxes weeks ago. Foxes that, that war against your romantic relationship, right? This couple in Song of Songs, it, it shows them um, experiencing disappointment, frustration. It shows them um, experiencing longings that aren't satisfied. Relationships are not easy because of the reality of sin. And so we see that loud and clear in these love poems. Right? We even talked about the power of sex. That line that's also said three times, do not awaken or arouse love until it so desires. It's a caution flag. But at the same time, there is a possibility to taste and to experience a return to Eden of God-ordained, passionate, intimate, vulnerable, dare I say, erotic romance as shown between these two lovers, just as it was for Adam and Eve in the original garden. Restoration and relational healing are possible in the name of Jesus Christ. Here's what this means for you and I. It means that our sexuality can be redeemed. That because of Jesus, which, oh, by the way, the New Testament, the Apostle Paul picks up the name of Jesus, and guess what Paul calls him? He calls him the second Adam. Isn't that interesting? Let me take this one further. You go to John 20. Here's a freebie for this morning. Mary Magdalene is outside of the tomb of the resurrected Jesus. You ever wonder, who does she mistake Jesus for? The gardener. Come on now. That's all free stuff this morning. And so all of a sudden you see in the scriptures, it's actually a story of a garden. And the message of the gospel is that it is possible to go back to a garden city. Now back to Jesus, the gardener, the second Adam. He can restore and renew and make things new. Anything that's gone wrong in your sexuality, single or married, divorced or widowed, porn viewer or addicted to masturbation, raped or abused, virgin or too many random hookups that you can't even count anymore. Jesus has the power to reverse, to restore, to redeem your sexuality. So, this morning, as a response to this whole journey that we've been on for two months, what I would hate as a pastor is to have a great sermon series and then for it just to drop dead and and results in no life change. That's not why we preach. We preach so that the Spirit can come alongside us and change us and transform us into the image of Jesus. And so this morning, the invitation is this, to stand underneath a hoopah, to stand underneath a hoopah. Now maybe you're wondering, I would assume you're wondering, what in the world? is a hoopah, what are these things over here? Great question. Let me explain this a little bit. A hoopah is an ancient Jewish tradition that's used in wedding ceremonies. It is a canopy under which the bride and the groom stand during their wedding ceremony. And it usually consists of a cloth or a sheet, and it's stretched over four poles. And here's the thing about hoopas. There is immense, significant meaning to them that goes back thousands of years. Some would submit all the way back to Exodus. 
Exodus, second book in the Bible, we read of Yahweh, the God of Israel, that usually the way that he makes himself known and felt is with a cloud, a cloud. And so, a couple examples of this. Many rabbis say that Exodus 19, which is a scene of, of Mount Sinai, if you're in your older years, you'll remember Charlton Heston here. Mount Sinai is the scene where Yahweh and Israel, where they exchange the Ten Commandments. We know those. Many rabbis will say that that is actually a wedding scene. And the Ten Commandments are actually, it's the covenant, it's the vows that they are exchanging. And Yahweh, the God of Israel, is the husband, and his people, Israel, are the bride. And what happens at Mount Sinai in Exodus 19 and 20 is that Yahweh, a cloud, comes over the mountain, his presence. They get married, so to speak, metaphorically. Israel then for years wanders through the desert. What guides and protects them through the desert? Cloud by day, fire by night. Once again, God's presence is known through a cloud. Then when Israel finally settles, they set up a permanent temple. And we read in 1 Kings that Yahweh's glory, His presence, this cloud fills the temple. And then check this out. Go with me to Isaiah chapter 4. It's our last passage for this morning. Isaiah chapter 4. Verses 5 through 6, we read this. This is going to put it all together. Then the Lord, and this is a promise about the future. Then the Lord will create over all of Mount Zionai, ugh, Zion and over those who assemble there a cloud of smoke by day and a glow of flaming fire by night. Over everything, the glory will be a canopy. It will be a shelter and shade from the heat of the day, and a refuge and hiding place from the storm and the rain. It is said that God's presence, His glory, will no longer reside over a place, but over a people. Come on now. So, these canopies represent and symbolize God's presence, cloud, Mount Sinai, in the wilderness, in the temple, and now residing over a people. So still to this day, if you go to an authentic Jewish wedding, they use hoopas today. They look a little bit different, a little bit more modern. And they stand underneath there, the male and the female, and what it means symbolically is that the presence of God is resting over this couple. The Spirit of God is blessing this marriage. See, sex isn't something that's naughty. In a Jewish and thus Christian worldview, it's something holy. And so this morning, as a fitting end to all of this, I want to invite you to stand underneath the hoopah and to invite the Spirit of God to rest over you, to bless you and your sexuality, to redeem any wounds, to heal any shame, to cover and protect. Now, I have to say this. There's nothing magical about these. Honestly, Matt Buffardi made them. <laughs> and they're amazing. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, let's give him a round of applause. <clears throat> he didn't want me to say that. But you're sitting front row right there, man. You're right in front of the hoopah. 
So there's nothing magical about them. However, we passionately believe that it's in moments that the Spirit of God can sanctify. So we as a church, Christians across the world in ages, believe in something called communion and baptism. And communion and baptism, they're, they're physical symbols, but they signify a profound, deep spiritual reality. And so in communion, the elements, they're physical, and they represent a gospel truth. When someone gets baptized, which by the way, we're doing next Sunday, you got to be here, it's going to be good. When someone goes under the water and then back out of, it is a, an expression, a symbol of them dying and rising with Christ. So a hoopah this morning is a moment in time, physical reality, that I think the Spirit of God can use to bring spiritual truth to us. And some of us this morning, and we were praying about this, some of us this morning, when we stand underneath the canopy, honestly, some of us may experience immediate healing over a porn addiction or whatever it may be. That can happen, and we believe that. We want to risk for that. John Wimber, who founded the Vineyard Movement, he once said that faith is spelled R-I-S-K. Love that. And then for others of us, we won't experience immediate healing. It's a process. It's a journey that could take days, weeks, months, years, decades. See, I believe that the Holy Spirit is active in both divine moments and also in a process. It's not one or the other. It can be both. We don't know how and we don't know why, but we know that he does heal through moments or through process. So maybe you are here and your marriage is in a rough patch. You're tired You've been arguing with one another, you're full of stress, you're at wit's end. The invitation for you in that situation is to stand underneath the hoopah. And, and so we're, we're going to have some shepherding elders, maybe some staff pastors in the back, and they're just kind of extending a hand and just praying over you. They're not going to say anything to you, they're not going to ask you any weird questions, nothing weird. But it's a posture of, we just want to bless your marriage with God's presence. Who doesn't want to be blessed with God's presence? Maybe you're here and you're single. And you are lonely. You are discouraged. You're isolated. You have no hope. The invitation for you is to stand underneath the hoopah. Maybe you're here and you've been through a divorce and you have years, decades of emotional pain that has not been processed. The invitation for you is to stand underneath the hoopah. Maybe you're here and you're widowed and you miss like crazy your spouse. The invitation for you is to stand underneath the hoopah. Wherever you are, male or female, young or old, single or married, divorced, widowed, watching porn, or have commitment issues, I don't know, and that's not my business necessarily to know. But what I do know is that our God is in the business of redeeming and restoring and bringing your sexuality back to the garden. So here's what we're going to do. It's hoopa time. That just sounds fun to say. I, we can, every Sunday maybe we can do this. So I'm going to invite the, the band back up. They're going to do three songs. I ended a little bit early this morning on purpose. Honestly, how I want to see this is I kind of think this should be like a healing service. We just want to make space for the Spirit of God to move. He's in control of that. We're not. We just want to make ourselves available. So it's this posture. 
So they're going to th- sing three songs. We're going to have some shepherding elders come up. And they're just going to be in the back of these hoopas. They're just going to extend a hand as you walk up. Now, you can walk up and you can stand underneath the hoopa by yourself, individually. If you're married, you can walk up with your spouse. If, if you're a child in here, maybe you want to walk up with your parent. That's all fine, however you feel led. And you can just stand underneath there and someone's just going to pray for you. Just that God's spirit, his blessing would be upon you. And that's it. And then you can just go back to your seat. We got three songs where everyone can get a chance to go. But it is my prayer that this series has been a journey where wherever you are, the presence of God can meet you in your pain, in your wounds, in your brokenness. And to begin to restore and redeem what's been taken from you. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, God, when you created this world, which is just something crazy to say, it says that your spirit hovered over the waters. It was kind of like a canopy over the waters. And you brought order out of chaos. And Lord, I just passionately pray this morning that you bring order out of chaos this morning. That you redeem marriages that are on the brink. Singles who are lonely and frustrated. Jesus, can we be a people, the bridge, that are redeemed in our sexuality as a witness to this world that knows nothing but brokenness? That we may be people who sit under your shade in the canopies because we just want to rest in your presence. We've had enough. We can't do this life on our own. We don't want to take a step forward without being covered in your presence. Heal us, Jesus. Minister to us. Come, Holy Spirit. It's an ancient prayer of the early church. Come, Holy Spirit.